clean water and clean air are imperatives of life itself. They are central to our agricultural and industrial economy, to our recreation, and to our ability to grow as a healthy and prosperous nation. Unchecked pollution of water and air could menace the very foundations of our society and in many parts of our nation. The threat is more actual now than prospective. More pressures to pollute will intensify as our population moves toward the 200 million mark and our country penetrates deeper into what is, in effect, a second industrial revolution. Your magnificent Pacific Northwest is one of the most fortunate regions in the entire land in terms of the abundance and quality of its air, its water, and its other natural resources. In the past, other areas in our country have enjoyed this eminence with you and lost it because their development was achieved without regard to the spread of pollution. There are 47,000 miles of streams and 2,500 lakes in Oregon. We often hear it referred to as the air-conditioned state. Well, it is indeed a paradise, as I saw for myself when I attended the Isaac Walton League of America convention in Portland. Never, never take your abundance for granted. Remember, where there is only so much water, the supply is never changing. Yet, in a few years, our freshwater needs will have doubled to the unbelievable figure of 600 billion gallons a day. A week's ration at that rate would be enough water to submerge the city of Portland to a depth of 437 feet. You in Oregon have a rich abundance of clean air and clean water. They were cleaner in the old days than they are now, and there are those who have described your Willamette as the dirtiest major river in the Pacific Northwest. Oregon and the nation stand at the threshold of a new stage of industrial and general expansion, and your state's sizable volume of tourism will increase now by leaps and bounds. It may well be that the program that you're about to see can do more for Oregon than perhaps any other state. You have so much to preserve that others, unfortunately, already have despoiled or lost. There is still an America that is wild and clean and beautiful. But there is also a dying dream of America where the waters are poisoned by the wastes of man and the breeze is strangled by the fires and fumes of civilization. No part of America still retains more of nature's original work than the state of Oregon, a paradise for those who treasure the unspoiled in sight, in smell, and sound. But who are these foul strangers in Oregon's paradise? At scores of such places along the rivers of Oregon where filth-loaded water pours from cities and from factories, the scrap fish gather, and their presence betrays water made sick and weary, water in which only the scavenger thrives. Oregon, the verdant land, where a thousand streams bring water plentiful and clean and make possible a bounty that a nation must envy. But raw sewage on a suburban street breeds disease like hepatitis, and serve shocking notice that the days of paradise may be numbered. The air of Oregon can be as sweet and fresh as its waters, but the very jobs they draw soil the air above and the waters below in numbers and ways faster than present planning and prevention can match. In government and in industry, men and dollars are put to work to keep Oregon's advantage. But in many places and in many ways, the effort is not enough, so that filth fallout costs you dollars and health. In lush orchards, a sort of tragedy strikes. This is our livelihood. <clears throat> we don't make any money on that fruit. We have to get out and work for it. And that's exactly what my wife and I are doing now. All about us, in ways sometimes smelled or seen, but in ways, too, that are invisible. Pollution fighters say food processors and canners and houseboat dwellers have been virtually unchecked in the contamination of the people's waters. Add to these outpourings the human filth from a huge navy of pleasure boaters and deep sea sailors from around the world. 
harbors in some parts of the nation long ago were forced to prohibit the use of marine toilets, or at least to require special treatment of their sewage. The Oregon Marine Board suspects dangerous pollution in some inland lakes, lakes from which people are taking their drinking water. The state sanitary authority, meanwhile, has ordered a special study of this new galloping menace to one of Oregon's leading recreational resources. The authority is looking ahead perhaps 10 years when Oregon's fleet of 50,000 pleasure boats is expected to multiply to 150,000. Seagoing ships make more than 1,600 calls every year at Portland's bustling Willamette River Harbor. Altogether, this great armada carries a total crew of some 60,000 men, enough to populate a medium-sized American city and all using the river as an open sewer. Health experts say that water that is safe for water skiing and swimming cannot have more than 240 units of disease-bearing bacteria in samples taken for checking. But the average number of such bacteria discovered in the Willamette from Salem downstream to the mouth was not 240, but 4,300. And in and near Portland, the count was up to 70,000 bacteria per sample at some places. One result is that the State Sanitary Authority regards the entire Willamette River, that is all the way downstream from Salem, as too filthy for swimming. All but final research proof has been found to establish the link between inadequate sewage systems and water pollution and an incidence of that serious disease, hepatitis, more prevalent in Oregon than in a majority of the 50 states. Recently, state and Washington County health officials came up with disturbing findings in the Metzger Sanitary District south of Portland. One in every five homes in that district was discharging raw sewage in a manner that threatened an outbreak of polio, typhoid, and hepatitis. Improper practices in irrigating and farmland fertilizing and in logging, road building, and mining add so much more to the warming up and to the soiling of Oregon's rivers. Test nettings in the Willamette show that only carp and other warm water trash fish are able to survive. And at times, even these scavengers perish for a lack of oxygen. There is scarcely a season when commercial fishermen's nets do not sometime become weighted with the thick, foul slime created by bacterial action in waste-loaded waters. At the same time, there is the threat from above. In the Portland area, the land layout brings 50 to 60 days every year of that smog-encouraging peculiarity of the atmosphere called inversion. This is more frequent than at any other place on the west coast outside of Los Angeles. Waste in the air, waste from furnaces, smokestacks, dumps, and auto exhausts has pushed Portlanders to the very threshold of our irritation. In terms of dirtied collars and curtains, blackened buildings and corroded paint, it is reckoned that $7 million a year is the cost to Portlanders of air pollution, a pollution which this year alone reputedly has cost the fruit growers of just one North Central Oregon area a million dollars in unsaleable crops. It is not that Oregon has been indifferent, quite to the contrary. Oregon has been in the forefront among the states in the campaign for pollution control. 
Among Oregon State Sanitary personnel are such nationally known experts as Secretary Curtis Everett Jr. of the State Sanitary Authority. It was a giant step forward for its time when Oregon created its State Sanitary Authority in 1939 to control water pollution. It was an even greater step when Oregon enacted the first statewide air pollution control law in the nation in 1951. Air pollution laws are as effective in their application as those of any other state. But new pollution problems caused by urban growth and new industrial processes occur faster than our staff can keep up with them. Look at just one aspect of the problem and you perceive what a catalyst the authority has been in changing the old ways for the better. When the agency came into being, only 38 communities in Oregon had even the most fundamental type of sewage treatment plants and only 11 were set up for second step treatment of sewage. Now, as a result of state persuasion ranging from mild suggestion to court action, local cooperation has raised the number of communities with primary treatment plants to 72 and those with secondary plants to 128. Even the city of Portland is numbered among the agency's partial conquests, although it took legal action to turn the wreck. All the blame for Portland's slowness to clean up its own filth cannot be placed upon the public official. In three decades, Portland voters have been asked to approve 10 tax or bonding measures that might have kept it a jump ahead of its choking sewage problem. Of the 10, the voters defeated seven, approved only three. Since 1938, the city has spent only $24 million on its sewage disposal system. It needs another $22 million to complete just the capital construction that is urgently required now. The city has on hand, or readily forthcoming, barely one-tenth of the money that it has to have. Evidences of the Oregon Sanitary Authority's influence in the pollution battle are to be seen on every hand, at mill sites as well as in municipal improvements. But is this to say that Oregon has repelled the invader, that there no longer exists the danger of pollution in paradise? No, when Governor Sprague uh, handed me the job, I thought it would be maybe a year or two or three. But I find now it's going to be a never-ending job <laughs> due to its very nature. There is joy unbounded among residents of Newport on the Oregon coast, in tours of other communities and by marching down their own main street, giving speeches and squirting perfume from atomizers. They're emphasizing that Newport smells good as a coast town short. But like so many efforts to curb stubborn pollution, it was an uphill bootstraps battle, trying to tame the odoriferous wastes from the Georgia Pacific Craft Mill at Toledo, eight miles to the east. A resort in motel town that depends on tourism, Newport found itself shunned by travelers. Property values began to sag, and the slide continued as word got around that Newport was the stench center of the Oregon coast. Desperate Newporters threatened lawsuits and pleaded with the legislature and sanitary authority for relief. While these pressures encouraged Georgia Pacific to intensify its efforts to clean up, the waste liquor from the big Toledo mill proved a stubborn enemy. Some of the company's attempts to subdue its rotten egg odor ended in abject failure, but prodded on by the state. Georgia Pacific spent two and a half million dollars in five years installing equipment to cool, aerate, and even chlorinate the hot liquor before sending it down an eight-mile pipeline to the bright blue waters of the Pacific. Not until this summer, at long last, did the Sanitary Authority cautiously agree that Georgia Pacific had largely freed the Newport Sea Breeze of its stinking cargo. But now there's a possibility that Toledo itself will have to cope with an increasingly serious condition. Aeration, which is simply the mixing of oxygen with the mill's waste liquor, seems to have intensified air pollution at Toledo. So Newport's gain in sweeter air may well be Toledo's loss. 
some medical experts speculate that nose and throat trouble suffered by local teachers could be traced to the bad air in this long-suffering little town. One health official has described the situation in Toledo as a veritable time bomb. While Newport has assailed Georgia Pacific for its air pollution, they themselves have neglected to provide a plant to keep their own raw sewage from the ocean. Two wrongs don't make a right, but those involved in both these cases maintain high costs are a barrier to quick correction. This has been especially true of Georgia Pacific's position. But on the other side of the coin, manager J.O. Juleson of Weyerhaeuser's paper mill at Springfield says money alone comes far from meeting the problem. We have not found the corrective measures we've taken here to be expensive. Of course, you realize the basic mill itself, the original mill, is a very expensive installation. But we have found that by the use of some good common horse sense and developing proper attitudes on the part of the people that work in the mill, that we've come up with these various suggestions which have been very effective and we feel have done a good job in protecting the air and the water around Springfield. Weyerhaeuser's performance at Springfield seems rooted in a strong desire to live as a good neighbor in the community. Among other steps to suppress pollution, the company has installed oxidation towers that strip toxic compounds from effluents. doubled the capacity of its logging pond to hold waste during low flow periods of the Mackenzie River. Installed a uniquely successful vapor sphere to trap sulfurous gases generated during the pressure cooking of pulp. And built precipitators to capture odor and dust from the mill's roaring furnaces. Through its plant laboratory, Weyerhaeuser keeps a sharp scientific eye on the purity of the Mackenzie. Finally, in cooperation with the University of Oregon, it has diverted effluent to irrigate the cow pasture of a nearby farmer. The farmer's grass grows greener and his cows thrive as a direct result of Weyerhaeuser's ingenious search for a practical, economical way to put a major industry burden to some useful purpose. But generally in Oregon, as elsewhere, pollution control fits Harold Wendell's descriptive, awful damn slow work. Not only is pollution the soiling of water and air, it is at the same time a terribly complex economic, technical and political issue, a fact that is dramatically illustrated by Oregon's Willamette River, which is the most worrisome. For this reason, and because the state couldn't reprimand individuals while government bodies were still offending, the sanitary authority began by taking up the problem of the cities. Portland, being the biggest, came first. As late as 1950, it was thought that primary treatment to remove just the solid wastes would be sufficient. Now, secondary chemical treatment is considered a must. And so, with $85 million spent on city sewage plants, Oregon finds itself running ever faster just to keep up. No one is more bitterly aware of the problems and the frustrations than Chairman Sherman Washburn of the board of Oak Grove Sanitary District No. 2, just southeast of Portland. One of the biggest jobs we have to do is to get people to recognize they actually have a sanitation problem. It's all too easy to ignore that water that flows down the street out front, where in all likelihood it is probably sewage effluent, which children and pets can track inside the house and expose the whole family to the danger of hepatitis. It's all too easy to ignore the fact that sanitarians will stop building in certain areas where the ground has lost the capacity to absorb sewage effluent. Actually, by 1955, the intensifying sewage disposal problem forced Multnomah County drastically to curtail new building permits. And with neighboring counties in the very same drainage area experiencing even greater population growth and urbanization, officials turned to the state for help. Multnomah County Commissioner M. James Gleason got from the Oregon Legislature the go-ahead for a master plan for three counties, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington, which comprise the Portland metropolitan area. This tri-county plan has moved ahead with some successes and some disappointments. Most of the disappointments because of finances. This is a problem that we must work on to improve the finances and improve the coverage. This is a plan that is designed to work by contract 
as between all the various political subdivisions to provide sanitary control over our entire drainage area through a single plant with the minimum of pumping and a minimum of expense. If this plan of contracts does not work, we will then have to take a look at a metropolitan plan such as Metro of Seattle. Indeed, the Seattle area's Metro plan has come to grips with an equally dire pollution situation, thanks to community cooperation, here summarized by Metro Executive Director Harold Miller. Like many of our major population centers, the Seattle area has been trying to cope with a rising problem of pollution. By 1955, the citizens of the area recognized that the problem was just about out of hand and that the 11 cities and 18 sur districts of the area acting independently could not resolve the problem. As a result, in 1958, the area, the voters of the area uh, held an election and created uh, the municipality of Metropolitan Seattle, or Metro, uh, which since that time has been engaged in the design and the beginning of construction of a 10-year, $135 million program which will solve the pollution problems on a permanent basis. The Oregon Legislature has set up an interim committee on local government to see how the Metro plan can be applied in Oregon. But one of these lawmakers from Portland says he dares not favor a Metro plan similar to Seattle's for his Portland constituency. He fears retaliation from the extreme political right wing, which wildly identifies Seattle Metro with some communist plot. Committee Executive Secretary Dick Kennedy of Eugene has become, nevertheless, a round-the-clock campaigner against piecemeal local planning. Oregon's urban areas are plagued with too many governments. In the Portland area alone, we find some 360 independent taxing units. The administrative costs of these uh, districts are extremely high. The efforts to reorganize are generally met with either apathy or hostility. Portlanders use 52 and one-third millions of gallons of water per day. This figure is a clue to the truly massive proportions of the water pollution headache in the cities and suburbia of Oregon. Industry's problem is illustrated by the fact that the water intake of just one Oregon pulp and paper mill nearly equals that of Portland's 400,000 residents. Crown Zellerbach's plant at West Lynn requires some 45 million gallons per day. Pacific Northwest pulp and paper operations create nearly one and a half billion pounds of pollutants annually. Enough unpleasant matter to cover a square city block to the height of a 54-story building. These wastes, only a small part of which can be turned into useful products, have a daily oxygen demand of more than 2,500,000 pounds. That is enough oxygen to sustain the breathing of more than 14 million persons. Part of these wastes are concentrated and burned but most of them are diluted and dispersed in the rivers and streams, making the pulp and paper industry the largest contributor of organic waste to the water of Oregon. Where these wastes are not treated in a safe manner, the effluent becomes an oxygen-gulping, slime-making scourge. It destroys fish life. It fouls fishing gear and fishing boats. Sometimes it churns at river's bottom, forming into rafts that rise to the surface as sluggish, foul-smelling masses of filth. There is one truth in this pollution business. The untreated wastes have to go somewhere. If not in the water, then into the air. And so we're confronted with air pollution. One source is the aluminum operations crowded close to the Columbia River to avail themselves of the abundance of cheap hydropower. The Harvey plant at the Dalles borders on cherry and peach orchards and poses the question of whether metals production and fruit growing can coexist in the same area. We are at the high school in the Dalles. This was last June at the 91st meeting of the State Sanitary Authority. The authority was taking up the case of the Harvey aluminum plant at the Dalles. It was the 12th meeting since the Harvey plant opened in July 1958 that the agency had been occupied with the subject of fluoride fume damage to peach and cherry crops that grow on adjacent lands. That same July, a press release from the Harvey headquarters in Torrance, California proclaimed proudly, the reduction plant will be smokeless and fumeless. But now, at the hearing this June, 
It was the issue of fumes that still divided industrial worker and orchardist. You can ask anybody around this area, we've raised peaches here for years and years. At least 35, 40 years, been in the peach business. And we know peaches. We don't need anybody to come in here and tell us how to raise peaches, because we know how to do that. All we need is something to control these fumes so they can raise the peaches. The orchardists have exaggerated this problem far beyond reason. If we should get excited now, and blame Harvey for the poor weather conditions and the other things for which they are not responsible and get so excited that perhaps our plant should be closed, then we could also be turning our city into what we might call a ghost town. Well, as we need in all of these areas is more research. This is something that we've been arguing for for a good many years. We are slowly getting uh, groups together and competences that will attempt to solve these problems. I hope that we can uh, induce some of the groups to start working on this one. The fact is that last year was the second highest crop in income return of this whole dozen or more years. And this is just last year. And we heard a lot of people talk about bad times in 1960 and bad times in 1962, but they just conveniently seemed to uh, eliminate 1958 when the plant started to operate and they conveniently f fail or try to gloss over and explain 1961. In late summer of this year, Harvey reported piping and screening for its monitoring system had been established on all five main buildings at the Dalles. The question of how effectively it would function was lent fresh urgency by the dumping of ton after ton of peaches which growers claimed had been ruined by airborne fluorides. But whatever the outcome of this tragic conflict, there still remained sawmill trash burners to dim the magnificent Columbia River scenery at the Dalles. Portland, too, has an air pollution dilemma. For 50 to 60 days every year, inversions hold all of Portland's pollutants close to the ground and give Portlanders more than an inkling of what smog-infested Los Angeles has to endure. Smoke and fumes from the city's factories, buses and automobiles, from plants ringing the city, and even from stacks across the Columbia, all supply the fuel for this weird phenomenon. TV meteorologist Jack Capel is one of the Portland area residents who has encountered this eye-smarting experience. When smoke and gas leave a stack, they cool and no longer move through the air, but rather they move right along with it. If the air is moving or rising, the dirt particles and gas molecules get scattered so far apart, they don't really bother anybody. But sometimes the air isn't moving or rising. This results from what is called a temperature inversion. It simply means that the air at some level aloft is warmer than the air near the ground. It's commonly known that warm air rises and conversely that cool air doesn't. It just lays there. Here's a typical case of a temperature inversion that often occurs during the early morning hours. The ground and the air near the ground have cooled during the overnight period. The air aloft is still warm. The dirt is trapped in a very stable, dormant layer below. During the afternoon, the sun heats the ground and adjacent air. The heated layer becomes unstable and begins to rise. The inversion is wiped out, the air is cleared, the visibility is greatly improved. Unfortunately, however, inversions don't always disappear in the afternoon. Sometimes they persist for several days. In the meantime, the lower atmosphere continues to trap more and more unpleasant gases and dirt. Then on some mornings when the city should sparkle in the sun, guarded by the green silver cone of Mount Hood, Portland is shrouded as if by the murk of some filthy twilight in a shadow world. In the Willamette Valley at Albany, motorists on Highway 99 often are assailed by billows of offensive smoke from the pulp plant of Western Craft Company. The process here is another that puts unrecovered waste either in the water or in the air. This plant is doing a little of one and obviously a whole lot of the other. Western Craft spokesmen say their plant has committed $250,000 to pollution research and equipment. The entire pulp and paper industry contributes to research by universities and the National Council for Stream Improvement, and some of the larger companies maintain their own research laboratories. Early in 1956, Crown Zellerbach's mill at Camus assigned its laboratory to a cooperative effort to starve the brown goop it was discharging into the Columbia, much to the distress of Oregon and Washington bathers, boaters, and fishermen. The research and subsequent corrective steps 
have sharply reduced the slime-making organisms in the Columbia, that is, between Camus and Vancouver. But despite the laboratory progress at Camus, the Crown Zellerbach plant is known to Portlanders for the odors and fumes discharged from its towering stacks. These represent some of the elements in the inversion plot that reduces a bright western metropolis on some days to a huddle of swirling grey shadows. And the culprit's trail, stretching in a great canopy from the mill stacks down across Portland, characterizes a situation that has led the U.S. Department of Public Health to designate the Portland and Eugene areas as places with definite air pollution problems. The Camus Mills three-quarter million dollar liquid waste disposal system features a 48-acre lagoon at Lady Island. It is now fairly common to use such lagoons for storing waste liquors until they can be released with less harm to the rivers. One of the Oregon City Mills barges its waste liquors to a rendezvous with the diluting waters of the Columbia. The company got a temporary permit to do this in 1953, nine years ago. The operation is expensive, but the company has found no other more economical way of trying to keep its waste out of the Willamette. Across the Columbia in Vancouver, the Columbia River Paper Company dumps its liquors directly into the river, and fishermen five miles below the city complain bitterly that their nets are gathering more slime this year than ever before. The precise scientific reason for this apparent increase has not been determined. The angry fishermen blame it all on those who feed the wide Columbia with paper mill effluent. Both the Oregon Sanitary Authority and Washington Pollution Control Commission have commended Crown Zellerbach's efforts and achievements at Camus. In 1961, Weyerhaeuser's Springfield, Oregon Mill won the Industrial Air and Water Protection Award of the Pacific Northwest Pollution Control Association. But do we have the right to ask why more hasn't been done by more people? to ask the question, not only with regard to the examples of pollution already shown, but with respect to Portland steel furnaces. Open burning. Fertilizing and irrigation. Homing detergents. Insecticides that sometimes upset nature's balance, radiation and the less well-known threat of chemical pesticides are poisoning man's environment. Many man-made chemicals acting in much the same way as radiation lie in the soil and enter into living organisms or travel in subterranean waters and emerge to plague vegetation and livestock and trigger strange human maladies. Insecticides indiscriminately applied are massacring birds, mammals, fishes, and indeed every form of wildlife. Some national figures insist that man must somehow make the breathing of safe air as desirable as the eating and drinking of safe food, milk, and water. Unless we do, city dwellers may someday have to live in air disinfected homes and offices, venturing forth into the sunlight with a plastic headpiece and a private supply of oxygen. grants the privilege of polluting air and water. Executive Secretary Don Lane of the Oregon Water Resources Board often has pondered this question. No one has an inherent right to pollute. Meeting of the pollution challenges by industry is properly and justifiably a cost of doing business. A spokesman for the Northwest's pulp and paper industry, Vinton W. Bacon of Tacoma, is convinced that the lion and lamb can lie down together profitably and comfortably. It isn't a matter as to whether the lion and lamb can lie down together peacefully and profitably. In the Northwest, they are coexisting that way. For instance, waterways such as this one can be made to serve industry, communities, agriculture, recreation, and fish and aquatic life. But sometimes, wastes do small cause small inconveniences. For instance, an oil field has a peculiar odor, but that oil field means the livelihood of people living nearby. They have made the decision that they will take the slight inconvenience of an oil field odor in order to have 
a healthy economy. How do such veterans of pollution work as Assistant State Engineer Kenneth Spees feel about the inevitability of pollution? It is true that in the majority of cases at least, the step-by-step -step techniques for further abatement of pollution are known. They are economically feasible. And yet, as we've seen and heard and see and hear again, there are those industries in which people are led to believe a choice has to be made between jobs and pollution. That the economy of the Dells depends on Harveys. Who brings home the bread and butter but those guys that are working out there? Or the little cooperation between the fruit growers and Harveys? It's a better feeling among all of us. No one in Oregon is more keenly aware of the state's imperative need for new payrolls than Gerald Frank, chairman of the advisory committee to the State Department of Planning and Development. One of the major advantages we have in selling the industrial development program of the state of Oregon is good livability. People like to live and work in our state. During the decade of the 60s, 180,000 new jobs must be created in our state. This can be done, I'm sure, without opening up the floodgates of air and stream pollution. Do such pollution experts as Oregon Sanitary Authority Chairman Harold Wendell think this possible? In the 23 years of the work of the Sanitary Authority, there hasn't been one instance where a plant has been closed down or where a plant has refused to come into Oregon because of the laws of the state. You must remember there's always a conflict of interest. For example, in Newport, it's between the, the paper mill there and the motel operators. In the Dalles, it's between the fruit growers and the aluminum plant. And happily, both those are on the way to solution and neither plant had to close down. But in a nation with a population verging on 200 million and a gross national product approximating a half trillion dollars, we must expect that pressures on the cleanliness of Oregon's air and water will mount to unprecedented intensity. Our research and personnel geared to this tougher challenge, our industry and taxpayer prepared to shoulder heavier responsibility. Dr. Wilson W. Town of the U.S. Public Health Service takes off his views of where we're short. I agree with the state sanitary authority that all cities should install secondary treatment works and all industries should provide adequate reduction of their waste. Another must is an adequate water quality monitoring system. Another overall pollution control planning and programming so that future locations of industries and other waste sources will be given consideration. Still another is stepped up research on pollution control problems. Most of these imperatives imply more trained personnel. In research alone, more facilities and scientists to work with them would soon supply plenty of sound information on which to move ahead. Just what is Oregon's score in these respects? These nine men in white coats represent the entire existing state sanitary authority staff in the Portland metropolitan area. The others represent, with the nine, the total number needed to turn in a really effective job. Many, many more hands must be turned to research, to monitoring, and most of all to enforcement. And League of Oregon Cities Executive Herman Curley holds that the cities alone cannot finance the anti-pollution campaign at the local level. Cleaning up the streams of Oregon has imposed a tremendous burden upon the cities of Oregon. The state has not provided any financial assistance, but I think that it must help if we're going to complete the job on a reasonable schedule and then keep ahead of the problem. The Oregon Sanitary Authority in 1960 made only 440 tests of the amount of pollution in river water not nearly enough by any standards, and a loss of funds has caused even this to be reduced by more than half. Stronger financial support is a must to supplant stop-and-go research at our universities with continuing programs, always seeking better means of water and air quality control. 
often relatively little money can do a lot if it's kept coming at regular intervals. Oregon State University engineering professor Charles Warren feels certain that much essential research could be financed on this basis. Research at this laboratory is directed toward increasing understanding of how man may utilize his waters for agricultural, domestic, and industrial uses, and at the same time maintain important commercial and recreational fisheries. This is not a very large laboratory, and yet at the same time it represents a significant portion of the research of its kind going on in the country. What is necessary are more laboratories of this sort with a broad-based research program that will lead to the ultimate solution of some of these problems, making it possible for us to utilize our waters for their many productive purposes. Knowledge worth millions in the war against pollution apparently can be had for just a few cents on each dollar of realized value. But how difficult it is sometimes to get research money when it's most needed was demonstrated at the 1961 Oregon Legislature. Senator Ben Musa of the Dalles well remembers his losing campaign for a $90,000 appropriation for Oregon State University research into the effect of airborne fluorides on sweet cherries. The bill was defeated and of course uh, we were extremely sorry. Harvey Aluminum Company exerted a great deal of uh, pressure upon the legislators and tried to say that our $90,000 appropriation was a waste of the taxpayers' money. Even before the coming of man, there was pollution of our air and water. Some pollution is inescapable, especially in a society such as ours, whose commercial and domestic demands on water and air constantly accelerate. Thus, some water, for example, must be employed for diluting pollution. But how much and what priority should be given this use are central to a great debate on which the shape of this region and this nation's future could well hang. Vint Bacon's position typifies that of concerned industry. Waste dilution and dispersion is one of the legitimate and beneficial uses of waterways. In some areas, under some conditions, the most important use. Dilution may be the only solution in some of the heavily populated areas of the East and Middle West. We in the Northwest will be in the same predicament if we give a vested right to any person to pollute the waters of our state. We feel that our waters are too valuable to be used for pollution abatement, that they must be reserved and utilized for higher priority purposes. A debate in which every citizen has a stake. But what of Don Lane's contention that Oregon should never give polluters a vested right in our waters? Oregon Attorney General Robert Thornton shares the conviction that Oregon's pollution laws lack teeth. I think that it would be very possible to uh, put a little more teeth into the enforcement side of this, particularly as it affects cities. Because in this way, you see, if a city doesn't vote for the bond issue necessary to put in the uh, facilities for the treatment of sewage, then theoretically, at least, there's nothing that you can do to actually compel it. I think there should be some procedure where the court, after deciding the merits of the issue, could give a mandatory order to the city or the industrial facility to compel them to do this. And our final witness, Oregon's Governor Mark Hatfield, believes that this line against pollution must not only be held, but indeed must be pushed forward. Water is our most important natural resource. I don't believe that any user of water has a right to pollute it. In fact, every user ought to return the water as free from waste materials as possible. We have laws in this state to protect the public's health and economy in the matter of anti-pollution. But these laws must have the full support of the citizens of this state. The last session of the Oregon legislature strengthened these laws against some opposition to weaken them. But we now have strong anti-pollution laws to help protect our water rights and our water users. I invite all who are interested in maintaining playgrounds and payrolls in this state with our most important asset, our water, to join in the enforcement of anti-pollution. And thus we can keep the Oregon way of life. So all the king's horses, all the king's men, the king himself are united 
the power of the state is consolidated, or so it would appear. Yet pollution still marches in paradise. There can be no compromise with this invader, while hundreds are stricken with waterborne disease. While scrap fish take over from trout and salmon in once pure streams. While outdoor recreation, 60% related to water, is denied to thousands. While outpourings of industrial and human filth corrupt our waters from cities, from food processing, from pulp and paper making. While industrial stacks betray the cleanliness of our air, damaging field crops, orchards and livestock, soiling our clothes and homes and attacking human membranes. While in short, our air and water are stained in countless ways as we mistreat our precious heritage. And it could be only the beginning. For how far pollution marches in Oregon is a matter in final analysis of citizen responsibility. Should the citizen face up to it, as did the sisters of Merrillhurst College when told that the college must spend thousands to combat pollution, then all will be well. All will be well if each of us recognizes he may be a polluter as well as a pollution victim. All will be well if growers, in their battle to correct a tragic wrong, allow certain acreage be removed from agricultural production so that reasonable agriculture and responsible industry can coexist. All will be well, too, if all industry rallies against pollution with the dedication of Weyerhaeuser's managers at Springfield the vigor of Alcoa's officials at Vancouver, where a pollution situation was rectified, or with the horse sense of the residents of Eugene and Hillsboro, who readily invested large sums to bring waste treatment facilities up to an effective level. But those will become common examples only if you provide the push in willpower and tax power to reverse the tide of a soon-to-be unequal battle to forget township boundaries and the misleading lure of a dollar saved today in favor of an area approach and thousands of dollars saved tomorrow. Oregon's future, in terms of payrolls and a way of life envied from afar, rides on the major resources of water and air, resources already blighted by pollution, resources you and I must not permit to be engulfed, lest the story of Oregon's destiny tragically be told in terms of pollution in paradise.